Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at the GNS530 as well as the GNS430 here in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. Now, the one thing I will say before we get started is that this is only present, at least that I remember, inside of the Cessna 172 that comes with the deluxe version of Flight Simulator. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind, although I have seen this thing pop up more than once in other, especially user aircraft later on, because of its versatility. So basically, what is this? It's a pretty classic style modern GPS. I've got a little bit of experience using one of these in the real world. I can say one of the best parts of these things are these little, little flaps down here where you can stick useful memories into them and kind of have fun with it. And honestly, the whole system works really, really well. So basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to be flying now. We're here at Kilo Papa Delta X-Ray today. That's at Portland International Airport. And we're going to be flying up to Seattle. I'll be skipping the trip quite a bit so I can show off the uh, different features of it kind of as we go. So first things first, uh, we want to go ahead and create a flight plan with this GPS. There's a couple different ways to do that. First thing we can do is we can press this D with an arrow and we can go ahead and go ahead and press either one of these buttons to select what cursor mode we want. First of all, we're going to push down on the cursor like this, which allows us to select. Then we can use the big wheel to go ahead and select what line we're on, and then use the little wheel to go ahead and dial in different details. In this case, we're going to be going to Kilo Sierra Echo Alpha, which is also known as Seattle International. So we can go KC. And again, you can go backwards and forwards. I'm using the little knob in this case. Whoop! You're going to do that about 100,000 times, especially in turbulence. Of course, my mouse wheel, this mouse is probably getting 20 years old or so, starting to get a little on the soft side too, so that makes this a little tricky. Unfortunately, we don't have the awesome ability to type in our abilities here. So I'm going to do KC and just want to press Enter, Enter, just like that. And now we are good to go. So I'm just going to go ahead and select on the Activate switch. We're going to come down here like this and press the Enter key a couple times. And now we've automatically selected our user waypoint, which is where we are now, and we're going proceeding direct over to Seattle, Washington. You can see now that we have this little magenta line. I'm going to go ahead and zoom out a little bit. And you can see, boop, there's our course right there. If we were to actually go over to flight plan mode, which is what this FIPPLE button does, it'll actually bring us here where you can see it. Now, what's this cool is you can actually go to the cursor mode and you can go ahead and add waypoints in flight mode as well. So for example, let me say I wanted to replace my KC, uh, a waypoint right here, with something like Olympia VOR, which actually is on the way. I could actually come in here and then I can manually adjust my waypoint to go ahead and simplify things a little bit. One of the things I will warn you with though is it's much, 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 much quicker to go ahead and get this all set up inside of the basic flight planner inside of, of Microsoft Flight Simulator before you come all the way out here and start sitting here tweaking knobs and doing wheels and stuff like that. Now notice when I press enter, nothing happens. You have to actually navigate down. In this case, uh, we have some duplicate waypoints. We're gonna select the waypoint. It's gonna be right there and press enter. And now notice automatically since it was pre-selected, Olympus now is going to be our new waypoint. And then from there, we'll proceed directly to Seattle. I'm going to go ahead and shut this off. To get back to the main page, I'm just going to press the FIPPLE button again. And now if I zoom out a little bit, uh, you can see clearly that this line takes us all the way here. And it's the magenta line, meaning this is the one we're going to be following along our route here. Now, you're probably saying, is there any way to get rid of all this junk? Uh, yeah, that's what the clear button's for. If you mangle the clear button, it declutters everything for you. If you press clear again, it goes back. There's actually multiple clear modes that you can use. Now, the cool thing is, since we've taken the time to program this flight plan in here, there's other things we can program too, such as approaches. I'm actually going to come down here and press the proc button, press press cursor, and I'm going to select my approach. Now, I take a look at the weather today. I have a couple different varieties of uh, runway approaches I can use here. Again, I'm using the little cursor here, and I'm using the big cursor to navigate around. We're going to be landing on ILS for 3, 4, right. I'm simply going to press the enter key. It gives you a choice to choose your transition. We're going to be via the Sonder transmission. Uh, transmission, what's that? Transition. And then, of course, we're just going to load. If you activated it, it would automatically start setting us up with the approach. I'm going to press load now, and I'm going to press the park button, and check this out. Now, if you actually press your cursor and scroll down, it will give you all the different waypoints you need for your approach. Now, one of the really slick tricks here, and I love this, is I can actually come in here and press the clear button, and it deletes that waypoint. Keep in mind, when you do things like that, that can have unintended consequences, so you want to be very cautious with that as well. And again, did you notice that when I deleted that, it instantaneously blew my entire route up and I completely lost Olympus? So you have to be very, very cautious with things like that with your approaches. So now if I went to put Olympus back in here, I'd have to rush in here and clean that up. I'll exit the approach page and I'll go back to my flight plan. And you can see, like I said, I've lost that because I deleted it. So that's something you're going to have to be very, very cautious with. Now, at this point, you're probably sitting here going, okay, so what else can you do with this um, particular GPS? Well, you've got a couple of different buttons. The first one, which is really important, is your CDI button. That's going to give you the ability to switch between GPS and VOR lock. 
Now, if you take a look over here, you'll notice that when I press the nav GPS button, I'm changing the navigation source for this aircraft's controls. In this case, um, we're going to be using the GPS. If I press that again, we're using the nav, aka ILS, aka VOR. I can also press CDI down here and switch it back to GPS. If this GPS light is not on, we are not navigating via GPS. So keep that in the back of your head. Other things we can do is we can control the radio. In this case, we have two com, we have a com radio here, VOR radio slash nav radio here. And we can do the same thing here. To do that, all you're going to do is you're going to take the big knob for the big numbers, and you're going to use the little knob for the little numbers. Now, if you want to switch them, you have to press this little C flip button right here. Again, we can go back and forth. Now, if you want to switch to edit the navigation frequencies, you have to push down on this knob here, and now we can edit them. Note that this frequency here is the standby. This is the active frequency. So you want to be very cautious with that. Now, the thing I want to warn you as well is when you do an ILS approach, these frequencies will automatically change themselves to be correct for that given approach. A couple other buttons on here. This would be the OBS mode, which uh, we don't have access to, which is kind of a bummer. It allows us to have a lot more control over the direction we approach a waypoint. We have the MSG button, which uh, provides you with Chinese food. Actually, no, it's messages. We also have the ability to show our flight plan, which you've seen already. And we have this handy-dandy vertical navigation. No, we don't. We have the proc button, which we took a look at a minute ago. Of course, we have the menu button. Pressing the menu button is pretty cool. It gives you the ability to do some really fun things with this particular um, GPS display. You can actually go to change fields button. Watch this. And you can actually select different fields. Now, if you're one of those people, you can come down to ETE, and you can actually use the little wheel to change all the details you want in this entire thing. We can set it to estimated time for arrival. Right now, it's at ETE. I'm going to set it to ETA, press Enter, and now notice, instead of ETE, it's ETA. Do you realize how powerful that is? You can customize all of these displays manually, and I go absolutely nuts with this. Again, I'm an ETA guy over an ETE guy, but everybody's a little bit different. Do what makes sense for you. Now, you're probably going, okay, that's actually really cool. Is there anything else we can do with this GPS? Uh, yeah. If you actually come down to the big page, and we have nothing selected here, you can actually roll to the right, and it changes to a different mode. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at these little bars that my mouse are kind of wiggling on right now, you'll notice I have three modes for the nav page. I have this one, if I use the little wheel, I have this one, which gives me kind of a flight plan preview, and I have this one, which is completely blank because it's not simulated. Now, if I grab my big wheel and go to the right, it gives me a whole brand new set of pages I can now explore. I can now go through this and this and this, and you're looking at it going, uh, dude, the, <laughs> what? Well, you have to make sure you dial in information in order to get information about it. So if I go to the airport page, for example, I'll go ahead and take a look real quickly. If I were to push my cursor down, I can actually select the airport that I want to get data about. So for example, again, I'll pick a random airport here. We'll do Echo 01, just as an example. It tells me where it is. It tells me its location, gives me its elevation. It could also give me critical information, such as uh, different types of frequencies and things like that. Again, I'm just going to press the Enter key, and you could go through, and it would tell you about the runways automatically. It would tell you all the different frequencies you're going to need to know. It would give you approaches if it had approaches. Everything would be built in here completely so that you could use that information. Now, if I go down here and I'll wheel to the up one more time, it brings us to the nearest mode, which is going to tell us where all of our nearby airports are. Now, if I wheel this one over, it's going to give us all of our nearest waypoints, fixes, or intersections. If we go like this, it's going to give us all our nearest NDBs, as well as their frequencies, which is awesome, because now we can actually use our NDB. We could come over here and be like, oh, cool, uh, I've always wanted to be on NDB frequency, tree, tree, two. So we can come in here and go, da, 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 ha, ha. of course, we can do this one like that. Of course, you got to be real careful. You have to actually pull the wheel out so that you can do the middle number. Then we could swap. Aha! Isn't that so cool? So did it actually work? Nope, we're not high enough to actually pick up that NDB. Coming over here, you get nearest VOR. Coming over here, you get nearest airspace, which is not going to be visible. Actually, there it is. It's calculating. Hey, there it is. So now, of course, if we come down here and go one more time to the right, again, we're on page four, if you want to think about it, we can actually change our channel spacing to make it easier to select certain frequencies. I'm a huge fan of 25 kilohertz, but again, if you don't know what this is, you really don't need to be messing with it too much. Wheel one more time, and I'm back to our main page. Now, you can see that this is actually a wonderful unit. It's basically a G1000 with a four-inch screen. Now, coming down here, this is our GNS430. It's basically the exact same thing as this upper unit. And if you look really carefully, you'll notice it copied all the information from the upper unit and it displayed it, which now means we can see all the critical information we need here while displaying the map up on the upper screen. Uh, you can see how incredibly wonderfully useful that is in any sort of flight. We, of course, do have a regular navigation page. If we wheel the small wheel over white to another once, now we've got a copy of the two different pages back to back. Of course, we have all our details, and you can also see we get this really, really groovy display like this if you go to page four. 
that's going to give you like you know your little compass built in it's going to give you your altitude your local time everything is completely built in with this and it all works out tremendously well again set it up the way that works for you we also of course have the multiple pages we can go to the airport pages we can go to the nearest pages we can go to the com setup pages and if we needed to do any uh, changes to any channels we have our buttons over here that work exactly the same as the set of buttons over here Okay, so that's pretty much it as far as the basic operation of this goes. Unfortunately, like I said, it's kind of messed up our, my little flight plan here, but that's not going to be that big of a deal. I'm actually going to do something a little aggressive. I'm going to go to the approach page, and I'm actually going to activate my approach early. Now, you're probably, actually, my approach is already activated, so I don't even have to worry about that. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because now that that's been activated, this line will now take me to that first point on that approach. Remember, it deleted that waypoint, so you want to be very careful with that. Oh, we'll go ahead and fast forward to the approach so that you can see what it looks like on the other end. All right, we're starting our turn onto our approach here. Uh, it was a pretty smooth flight. We got to go by Mount Hood, which is always wild because that thing is tremendously tall. We're basically taking our initial approach fix here, and uh, we're still on GPS mode. Now, one thing that's really, really handy is the GPS was smart enough to automatically prepare the actual approach uh, information that we're going to need for our landing. Remember, we're going to be doing the 3-4 right approach here. So uh, just taking a look at my notes just to make sure everything is right. We should be on 110.30. So we'll take a look real quickly here. I can see I'm on 110.50, which is actually the wrong frequency for this particular approach. Looking at my left window here, and you can see it pretty clearly. You notice, by the way, we're still on GPS mode, which is a pretty handy dandy for us. I'm actually gonna zoom out a little bit so you can see it a little bit more clearly. Speed up time just a little bit to make our lives a little bit simpler. And I wanna kind of show you how this undoes itself as you get a little bit closer here. Now we're gonna be taking our left to our final approach in just a second. Zoom in just a teeny tiny bit. Again, zoom is a wonderful thing. One of the nice things is you can always use the different zoom down here as you use it was up there. So you could use this as the precise zoom and you could use this as the broad zoom. Again, it's such a wonderful setup and you can take a look right out the front window and you can see everything is ready to go as far as our landing goes. Now remember, we're coming in on the three, four right, which is gonna be this runway right here where I'm pointing here. So one thing we wanna do is we wanna make sure we're on the right frequency for landing. So I'm gonna go ahead and push this button. We're gonna go ahead and dial in right now. We're gonna be looking for a frequency of 110.30. Go ahead and set this up for us. Go ahead and press the swap key. And now we're on the correct frequency and you can see instantaneously, this thing automatically picked up that new information. I'm gonna flip my CDI to V-lock mode because again, you can't use an ILS approach unless you're in the correct mode. And I'm just gonna come on down here and bop the APR button because that's all I need to do. Now that approach has been armed, what the aircraft is going to do now is it's going to be flying via the ILS, which is doing a really nice job of right now. I'm going to speed up time just a teeny tiny bit, get us all nice and lined up. And you're going to see that even though the GPS is still showing us where we are, our actual path is being controlled by the ILS since we selected the correct frequency for it. Now, normally what you want to be doing, of course, this entire time is you want to be communicating with air traffic control. But again, this is just a demonstration on what you can do. Now, one thing that we do in the real world that we don't get to do here is usually what we're going to want to do is we're going to suspend sequencing of our waypoints. The reason we do something like that is because we don't want it to keep going through the waypoints in the event that we have a missed approach. Now, since we're on the descent, we'll go ahead and get ready for the missed approach. This coast, I'm just taking a look at my notes here. A missed approach in this particular area is going to take us up to 5,000 feet. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and dial in 5,000 feet here, just in case we need to do it. We're also gonna make sure we're gonna be heading correctly. We wanna be proceeding direct by a tree 41 SEA. So Seattle is 116.8, so I'm just dialing in all these details. Again, uh, those of you who are familiar with this approach know exactly what it's gonna look like. That's all set to go. I highly recommend, by the way, that if you are gonna be using the ILS feature of this particular plane, you probably wanna point this so it actually makes sense. In this case, our approach course is supposed to be tree 44, which is all the way over here, which makes a lot more sense, because when you look at this, those two make much more sense. One really cool trick is if you wanna get ready for the uh, missed approach, we can actually use this CDI down here for that purpose as well, which I'm actually gonna get all ready to go. I'm gonna set this to 116.80, which is Seattle VOR. Go ahead and flop, it should go boing, and go zing, there it goes. So remember, we're gonna be on the tree floor one in the event that we do have a missed approach. So now we can just quickly go down here. Unfortunately, we cannot use this GPS to drive any roll plans on this particular aircraft. That's kind of a bummer, but yeah, deal with what you can. Oh, we got a low fuel warning. <laughs> I did mention this was a bit of a flight, didn't I? Now, I have actually not seen that warning in so long, it's not even funny. It's actually, it's kind of neat. Like it never happens to me. All right, let's go ahead and make sure we're ready for landing here. That looks good. 
Landing lights on, bacon lights on. I really don't need this because it's during the day. I don't need this because it's during the day. Everything else is set. Make sure it looks good. Trim looks good. Gunfuls looks good. I really wish I could shut that light off. I can, but I'm not going to. All right, let's go ahead and put this thing down on the ground and we'll go ahead and call our flight right there. Again, this has uh, been a demonstration of the G530 and as well as the GNS430. They're great rural GPSs. Our implementation here over in Flight Simulator Land is pretty good. I wouldn't call it perfect, but it's like 95% of the way there for most of the kind of flying that you're going to be doing. I'm sure in a month or two, somebody's going to release a much more sophisticated version of it that will give us all sorts of fun little bells and whistles, like, you know, bringing up approach plates and charts and stuff like that automatically. So we could go ahead and you know, kind of plan those things out a little bit more aggressively. Uh, one huge piece of advice, don't delete waypoints because it'll blow things up on you. I highly recommend that you do all your flight planning in Microsoft's flight planner directly before trying to do something like that on this one because it's just going to give you issues every single time you try it. All right, let's go ahead and put this thing uh, nice and gingerly on the ground and then we'll go ahead and call it there. Go ahead and reduce to uh, real time here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and drop the throttle all the way out because we need to get those flaps down. Feels a little naughty landing an aircraft this small at a Seattle International Airport. Ah, oh, there's Seattle right there. Slow down a little bit more. We got to get into the white line here. Right there. Next notch of flaps. I believe that should put us all the way down. Start slowing down. Again, it's a Cessna, so you get 65 knots. It's uh, usually more than enough to land. Get a little bit of turbulence. We are flying with rural weather today. It's actually pretty nice, but it's definitely getting bumped around a little bit here. 70 is a little fast. That's more like landing a Piper Archer or something. You need 70. I can't believe the low fuel light came on. That feels so weird. <laughs> All right, I'm going to continue my approach pretty nice and gently down, confirming that my speed looks good. Looks pretty darn good there. Oh, what is that? Let's take a look real quick. Ah, that's what I thought it was. It's the ILS array. Now, you got to wonder how these lights are now. I'm not even going to worry about that. All right, we're assessing this. So I'm going to go ahead and kill the autopilot now. We're going to point right at the big old 3-4 right at the end. And we're just going to come come down nice and gently on our own. You got to reduce the throttle a bit because we did increase our ascent angle. Again, we're trying to land at the giant number 34 if we can. So I'm going to pull the throttle back nice and early. We're going to get very close to the ground. We're going to hold the nose up. Play keep away for just a second. As soon as you feel the bump, we are down. Ha <laughs> ha! All right, folks, hopefully that uh, tutorial is sort of helpful as far as using that GPS. I love that thing. I really wish it was a touchscreen. Like, yeah, I think it's the GTN 750, the 850 is a touchscreen. Those are also like this big, but I'm sure we'll see those in a few years. Enjoy.